<laughs> well, I'll, I'll massage the questions into you really gently, don't worry. The, um, we actually met years ago um, when I came to uh, the Johnny Jay's like office um, up in, you know, right. up in the, what's the name, the Northern Quarter kind of back yeah. up near Sankey's, where Sankey's yeah. was, yeah. And I came up to play him some demos and um, you guys were either listening to or doing something to mixes of some of the final Dust Junkies bits before it uh. went to the album. And uh, yeah. I was enthusing about Prince, and you were like, "Oh yeah, I love Prince." He said, "I love oh, right. Want to be your?" And you were, and you were saying about "Want to be your lover." So I knew you were a proper. I knew you actually right. knew Prince because you know, otherwise, yeah, yeah. if you didn't, you'd just say, "Oh yeah, I like Kiss." Yeah. Or, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So I was yeah. like, "Oh, no, so I've, just, yeah, I've just had a Prince." A Prince um, I've had a moment on Facebook. I've been posting up some Prince. Oh, have you? Yeah. Wicked. Um, yeah. I, I don't spend much time on Facebook, but I'll go and have a look for the... Yeah, no, no, no. I'm just oh, remembering him. Yeah, I mean, being honest, there's no one uh, no one bigger for me, really, um, in terms of, you know, the just everything he meant to me. I think my sleeping hours are modelled on him and, like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> All sorts of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so, yeah, that's... The, but, yeah, um, I was... Yeah, I mean, before we get into it, I was just like uh, revisiting. Like, I I listen to it at least at least every year in the summer. My Dust Junkies album comes out, but I was just listening to it on headphones whilst wandering around, and um, there's such a lot of good bass work on there, man. There's such a lot of really nice. <laughs> like, there's some re like remember is it remember the day is it um, yeah. is it remember the days it starts off and he and Sam's playing the chords and then you come in with like. Really, oh, like, a little really bit. high up like stuff, and and then in the middle, like later on, you play an even better one, like yeah. like uh, yeah, it's just some lush stuff, and also any little gap. There's a nice little if there's a nice little space there. I'm trying to think of like I was earlier trying to think of bassists from around that time that were actually yeah. playing that kind of stuff, and there's they're few and far between really because mm -hmm. Living Color was split up, Chili Peppers were kind of on their way to becoming like Californication era. So there wasn't anywhere near as much kind of, you know, cool, intricate slap and high up stuff and everything. It's more like simple melodic lines. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, who was it that I came up with? Uh, just Skunk and Nancy. Just, that was the only person I could think of. Like Cass, because Cass plays a bit of like cool stuff, hides it in between. Yeah. But even, even by that time, I feel like Skunk and Nancy had become a bit less of a funk rock band and more of a kind of straight, like a kind of more anthemic rock or when they did do yeah. rock. there's a couple of funk rock songs on each album like later on but but like in the late 90s i felt like it was a lot different to like paranoid and sunburn when they first came out and it was like very comparable to like rage for example or whatever. yeah but but yeah like i was thinking there's like almost no one in certainly in the band kind of way of doing things you know yeah and yeah, yeah that, Maybe that's Maybe because I wasn't very good, I could just do what I could just do what I did, and that was it. Yeah, you know well, I mean? it, sounds, just... it sounds like you got away with sounding like you were good anyway, mate. So you blagged well, us well, all. Well done. <laughs> well, I was given I was given room to play as well. They were kind of always encouraging us. Come on, uh, let's yeah. have some more. I, it feels like a band where no one was really told to. I mean, I might be wrong, and maybe this is more point for, to do in the interview. But it feels like a band where at least the band members uh, weren't. Um, there was no one telling someone, oh, no, well, we don't really do that or don't do that or whatever. Like, it feels like there's ideas flying off from, like, the, the cool little deck bit scratches or samples uh, and stuff. It's that it feels well, like yeah. there's a big creative To be honest, going that, that yeah, could yeah. be farther from the truth, though, yeah, really. Yeah, I was say, <laughs> really? I was say, <laughs> Did you have, like, a, a, a strict the remit? Of it. Did you have a strict remit, then? It was yeah. difficult. Sam definitely got hammered, didn't you? You got hammered. You got like, because Sam, Sam was like an absolutely fantastic shreddy metal guitarist. He could do oh, right. just okay, about yeah. anything. He could do about anything. But what he needed was someone to pull out the bits that we wanted. Right. From his from yeah. his repertoire and, yeah. and tunes well, tunes was not very subtle. We would right. get him in the corner. We basically really? hammered him. No, not that. Th no, that's, not that that's shockingly surprising to me that the <laughs> tunes was not subtle. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, that's, kind of, that's a story that we should say for the. Uh, I mean, that's that's like. Yeah, how we I should really work it. in some order. I was just I was just uh, having a chat whilst waiting for you to get on and everything. Your studio yeah, looks no, no, lovely. 
Your what studio looks think? lovely. What it's is it? work. How, how long have you had all of those guitars then? Are they like your babies that you've had a while? Well, these two were from the Dust Monkeys. These right, yeah, we from a um, <laughs> bought with the with the record deal money. Uh, yeah. And the others I've just kind of acquired over the past few years. Right, I've wicked, got, yeah. I've got I'll crappy guitars, but I still love them. Like they're all my they're all they're my guitars. I made the sounds with them, yeah. and I don't really do you know what I mean? They're I haven't really got yeah. many good ones. I've got one that sounds okay, that would be like studio standard and everything else you could get away with for live stuff or something. And you I've could potentially one. trash That's it worked. and not care. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I've got, um, I mean, what have I got? I've got like five electrics, two acoustics and one bass. And my bass is like a encore. I think a couple of the guitars are like <laughs> squires and satellites and things like no, that, yeah. like the copy yeah. of the main one. And do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so yeah, but um, I've never really, I never got a record deal. So there you go. <laughs> I put out all my stuff on an indie. I needed a big advance so I could go and spoil myself. <laughs> so yeah, okay, let's let's zip right back to the beginning then and try and re, re, restart. <clears throat> um, thank you so much, uh, Steve and Sam for joining me. Uh, and uh, late notice, you rushed in and you know saved my bacon. So thank you very much uh, for organizing <laughs> yourselves. And um, Steve for drawing yourself away from your uh, ho uh, home, <coughs> home bliss slash cave, whatever it might be. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of um, you guys. Uh, I discovered you guys because I'll give you a little background so that you know from what perspective all my interview knowledge and everything is coming from. It's not hmm. uh, I, there's not a lot of evidence of you guys online actually, which is why I'm really pleased to be doing this. Um, yeah. And so when I was trying to do extra research, I found almost nothing. And so actually I had to go on what I already knew from when I was a fan in the day, if you know what I mean. So I moved to Manchester in 1997 uh, because my girlfriend had a uni course and I decided to get away from Oxford and learn about beats, basically. Learn about hip hop and drum and bass and all that kind of because Oxford was really indie. And uh, so then I came, I went to Manchester and um, like tried to dip my toes into the scene a bit, but didn't really get that far and everything. But um, also did like some college stuff uh, where I was like working out at Spirit Studios and the, the colleges mm. over there and everything. So yeah. through a lot of that, I was making demos and then fielding them out. And so I, I happened to give a demo to your DJ um, at the time. Um, and he right. was really nice. Um, yeah. And then I think he might have been the person who said you should get in touch with Johnny J and go up and see him. And obviously already I was like, I found you guys, I think it was through my Fun Loving Criminals fandom, being honest. I think I took a punt on uh, Drug Queen, living in the pocket right. of Drug Queen, I should say, um, <laughs> because it had the Fun Loving Criminals yeah. remix. And yeah. I was like, I'll give it a go. How bad can it be? 99p for a piece of vinyl. It's, I think it might have been even been a nice color or it had a really nice cover at the very least or whatever. And um, so, so I, and, and I love the song. Like it's still a total banger. Like everything, every part of it is like really, it's like it was constructed by a rocket scientist of how to make a <laughs> banging rap rock tune because it's got all the bits in all the exact right places and everything. So I'll come, I'll circle back around to that in a bit. Um, but I just wanted to say, so everything I'm saying is from this perspective of, I knew you for a bit. I came and saw you as much as I could whilst I was in Manchester. And then I left Manchester and you guys seemed to kind of more or less disappear at the same time. And then you reformed a little while ago and I was like, the dust junk is back. Awesome. And I got in touch with you, obviously. And, and then I've been, since I've been on Insta, I've managed to hook up with Nikki for like a couple of chats and done him a little remix yeah. or whatever. And so that, so all of my perspective is just from like this really outside of the, the whole story. So I, if I say anything that's, a, uh, un, I didn't mean to be, but I was offensive or it digs up something bad or whatever, then just say and move on and I won't take it badly like, at all. It's all good, it's all good. Yeah, so, so, but you know, it's just innocent blundering on my part if I do so. So, yeah, but um, right. So, okay. So, thanks very much, Sam and Steve, for joining uh, us. Uh, I want to go in some kind of sequence because that's how my brain kind of works. So, I wanted to ask you both, I suppose, as individuals first, what got you playing and what 
like your kind of beginning early memories of who you liked or who got you playing or what got you playing and all that kind of business. Do you want to go first, Steve? Or whoever, uh, whoever feels like going first, it's a free for all. You first. can even butt in and go, yeah, and then yeah. I did that, and then I did that. <laughs> Do it like a rap well, battle. <laughs> yeah, to, to cut a long story short, I started playing because my friend that I was kicking around with when I was 19 started playing acoustic guitar. And so I just didn't have anything to do. So it was a complete accident. I started playing bass because I was bored of watching him go C major, C major. And so I started playing this guitar he had next to him. I started just tuning the strings down, hitting it with the knife. Yeah. And I thought, was well, I'll just start. Yeah, yeah. All right. That was him. So I started playing bass and I, and I totally got into it by accident. I've never wanted to do it. I've never been like, yeah, I want to be a not, rock star. Not, oh, I want to, or I want to play music at all. Did you no, like? Just, just did you like got music a lot before, or did you get into listen, music through playing music? I, I listened to music. I loved listening to music. My brother was a guitarist. He played right, in a okay. reggae band. He was a great, great guitarist, and he was always playing the great stuff: Jimi Hendrix, what all this stuff. I like fuck off. I'm not interested. Really? So no, I, I, yeah, I wasn't interested. And then I started playing. I, I had something. I had a little something. So that little something, I went with it. Right, wicked, amazing. And yeah, so, who, who were your Steve? Who right. your form? Sorry, you're no, I'm saying you, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize you were so old when you got into it. That's pretty old, nineteen. Yeah, yeah, nineteen. Uh, yeah, I was, I was, I was about seventeen. Long. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that is quite late. Um, so, who who were your kind of formative? Like, who were you listening to, bass players wise, and trying to like learn your licks off of and stuff like that? Uh, the, the first bass line I can remember was the chain. Is it chain fleet with Matt? Right, of course, yeah. Dum, dum, dum. First sort of, that's the bass line. <laughs> but, um, it, right, one of the reasons why I'm a bit shady on interviews is I can't remember. I can never sure, remember Sure, that's stuff. all right. That's I'm, fine, I understand. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the guy with a million stories. Always, I'm so sketchy. Sam remembers it all. And I, get these vague colors. I have these vague colours and I can sort of remember this, <laughs> this period. But um, I used to listen to Slave. There's a punk band called Slave. Right, yes, yeah. yes. And, it, and when I heard, um, there's a, a bass player called Doug Adams. And right. when I heard his bass playing, when I heard him, I was just like, it was right up in what's the mix. This? It was right. Yeah, what's this? Because it was these chords and it was like, Whoa. Yeah, right. And then I've always been tuned into bass. So I've, I've always. Right, yeah. I think, I think when I first heard um, Melvin Gibbs from Rollins Band, I was like, oh, right. yeah. this, is, this is not how I usually hear this stuff, yeah. you know what I mean? And obviously that kind of broadens out. So you start to notice bass chords after you've heard bass chords and like in yeah. your face, you start to notice them in other records. Yeah. But before that, you don't really notice them as much, I feel like. Um, so yeah, then obviously I'd notice, oh, Muzz Skilling's plays quite a lot of bass chords in Living yeah. Colour stuff or whatever, but I'd never really picked up on it and stuff. So yeah, um, so Sam, yeah, so you, how did you get started? Uh, similar kind of story to Steve, really. My uh, my next door neighbour, um, well, that's, Sister, my elder sister, played guitar, but I never really paid it much mind, really. I was never really musical when I was a kid. Um, but then my next door neighbour, my best mate, came home from school one day with a bright red, I don't know, some kind of South Korean Stratocaster or something. Right. And, uh, <laughs> oh, so, oh, it was just so cool that he started playing it. So I remember one day I got my sister to uh, to teach me the coaching. I just told her to teach me something really cool. I was into, um, I was into U2 at the time and right. wanted to be a drummer. Uh, but then uh, I kept hearing this guy, this Hendrix guy. So uh, that's my sister to teach me the, it would teach me a Hendrix song. Right. So she was on the way out to town. She taught me the chords to Hey Joe, and right. then didn't think anything of it. And then by the time she came back, I could actually play it. And that's when it sort of like took a hold. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Then yeah, there was so just like me and my next door neighbor battling, and my cousins were playing as well. So there was battling with cousins as well. And it yeah. Sort of like I have to be honest. When I first with. when I first heard your um, your style. It was like, oh God, this guy like plays like Hendrix, but gets it kind of plays like Hendrix. Do you know what I mean? Like there's like there's something in it that's like it's like the same way that I, I've only ever I don't like a lot of Hendrix. I like Hendrix covers, but I don't think a lot of the guitarists do a good enough job on a Hendrix cover, if that makes sense. And uh, yeah. so like mm. I I've um oh Ben Harper, so the guy and he plays a laptop. And it has all this kind of saturation in there. And that for me is like key to the Hendrix kind of, there's got to be a lot of the kind of 
the other noise kind of fighting against the note that you're playing, if that makes yeah. sense. And you yeah. have that in your play, like fever on the um, the solo and a lot of the kind of the little tucked in bits in, in that song. There's tons of stuff where it's like, oh, this guy plays like Hendrix, but really, really gets it. Like, it's not like just the kind of like, I learned these. And a lot of the softer songs as well. I know you, um, I remember reading a review of, uh, in maybe Melody Maker, I think it was, or something of that nature, Enemy or Melody Maker mm. or something. And it said uh, that your, when it was reviewing the album, that the ballads were, and were, were made them sound like living color or something. And they said it in a really derogatory way. And I was like, awesome, greatest band ever. And they sound like them, do you know what I mean? Like, uh, but I actually thought that was also not that true because if you listen to Living Colors ballads, uh, yours actually sound like, a lot like, Hendrix ballads, like things like Wind Cries Mary and um, Castles Made of Sand and things like that with the intricate melodic playing. Whereas a lot of um, Living Colour ballads don't actually go that route at all. Like your... Um, mm. uh, yeah, I know what you mean. But Love I mean, Rears It's Ugly Head or something. Isn't that Hendrixy at all, really? Do you know um, I mean, but, I mean it's, it's funny because like back then, um, like, as Steve said, I came from a bit of a shreddy sort of heavy right. background. Uh, I mean, I started with all the Hendrix stuff mm -hmm. and was like mad into him for a while, but then got like into some crazy stuff. And, what, uh, so and are you talking Vi yeah, yeah, and Malmsteen yeah. and stuff like that? Or? Yeah, I was never really a Malmsteen fan, but yeah. I was a massive fan of Steve Vai. Absolutely massive. Right, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, at the time, I think uh, I was coming off the back of, I'd gotten into Megadeth and Pantera and uh, listening to Tool. And uh, I think I mentioned that. Actually, oh, wow. The first week we had, that was into Tool and the... Uh, uh, that's another, yeah, that's another story anyway, but um, when I remember when it came to sort of, I was, when it came to sort of jamming with Steve and, uh, I mean, it was Steve at first because Mike wasn't a part of the band when I was first right. roped in. Um, I remember thinking, I have no idea what I'm doing here. And basically having to, I mean, Steve will tell you himself, I was basically nicking whatever he was playing on the bass and trying to sort of find something that was right was, uh, around it yeah complimentary or you know with my own sort of guitar -y version of whatever he was doing so right. a lot of it came from that really i don't i mean i never I'll, I'll never forget when um i mean how i ended up in the band i guess we'll we'll talk about that yeah but, i was uh, gonna ask that very ne that was gonna be my next question how you guys met and see it all started up so yeah well i mean I, I knew steve i mean steve's Road into the band's different from mine, but I knew Steve because Steve used to play with my dad. My dad's a he's a musician, right? Um, so I'd, I'd hung about, about a bit with, with Steve, and um, he lived above uh, a little toy shop in Didsbury that my mum had for a while that uh, used to sell these wooden toys and stuff. Yeah. And uh, I used to work there on a, on a weekend on, when I was about 16, right? With horrendous hangovers, I'd, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd been, uh, working in the, in the toy shop in Didsbury, and I'd take my head take off my the counter car. like this, yeah. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> Got some horrendous stories about having to run out back and back and all that, but anyway, that's enough. But no, um, I used to take my guitar in there to, uh, to play on the stairs. Um, in, my, in my lunch break, I was like mad in, into guitar, I just couldn't get enough, yeah. so he used to play everywhere with me. And um, Steve came down one time and was like, oh yeah, um, you, you, you play pretty well actually, if you want to come to this jam night. Um, the, Steve had a jam night on it, uh, PJ Bells it used to be called, it's, uh, well, it's Matt of Fred's now, isn't it? Um, in Manchester, right? And uh, I went down. No, no, there Steve, with... he can't remember. Oh, <laughs> I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> but I went down anyway to these PJ Bells, and my mum took me. I was only 16, I wasn't really allowed to be in there. I remember right, I, brought, yeah. uh, I brought my Ibanez, my white Ibanez RG350 guitar. It was like oof, the closest I could get to Steve Vai at yeah. the time was as possible. <laughs> but distortion pedal, and then this, um, this chromatic pitch shifter pedal oh right wicked yeah i, I love I've got, i love them yeah they're my favorite but i went i went on, on stage i was like mad into buy like i said so I had this pedal and did like a, a fifth down and started doing this heavy sort of wicked. distorted pitch shift yeah yeah that, it looked like uh, the riddle of uh, steve vice passion of warfare right steve okay. came this funky thing and it turned into this like great jam and apparently i didn't think anything of it i just came back on stage and had a half a coke and then went home with my mum but yeah. well, apparently um, the talk had gone around that there was this young guitar player that was this, that doing something cool that was Wicked. living in Manchester. And, awesome. and, so yeah, you're a bit... the, 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 the word apparently reached Johnny J. So I remember the first time I was contacted by Johnny 
it must have been 17 or something like that, and just got this weird phone call at home. Um, some guy asking me if I wanted to come down to a studio, some sh- shady studio in Longsight, and I was like, hey, right, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Put the phone down, I was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's it's funny when I did go up there. Um, like I, I I played some demos and Johnny was interested in doing stuff with me, and I kind of wimped out on it because I'd heard that um, I heard like a week later that there'd been a drive by, like out just outside the studio, and to my little kind of you know I can't remember how old I was like eighteen year years old or maybe nineteen at a push. I was just like ah that sounds really sick. as it was I was like in rush home right next to Moss Side and stuff and that was as close as I needed to be to anything scary as it was there was like drive oh. bullet holes in the news agent wall like across the road and do you know what I mean things like that so that was as close to the gangster life as I needed to get and a couple of the rappers that like I did stuff with at the college you'd go to like drop them off at their place to grab something and you'd have to like wait at the bottom of the road because there's a load of guys all at the top of the road like and he and he'd say no 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 you guys stop here I'll go and get my stuff and I'll come back. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, that, was, that was that was a bit like my experience really as well. I remember um, whenever we used to we used to drop Gan off before or, or we used to pick him up or drop him off after gigs or whatever. He always used to put his gear into like these big black bin liners and like be they'd sneakily take it into his flat and I'm like, oh, yeah, just hang on a minute and then come in in and out. And I always thought that was a little bit dodgy, but that was like my sort of introduction into that sort he of was just uh, keeping his stuff of, safe wasn't he yeah. well basically yeah yeah i mean, <laughs> but, I mean the moonraker where moonraker was the uh, state behind it that was like the center of, uh, of the one of the biggest drug gangs apparently in, uh, in manchester so it's, yeah, it's, it's no it's real a, wonder that it's an interesting it's, city and i think i feel like the the band that you are um you're as representative of manchester in its own way as um as say I don't know, like Cypress Hill are of LA, or do you, like something like that, like where it's like, oh, this is that's the you get a real smell of the city. Like um, there's stuff like um, like the lyrics where it's close close to Main Road. Uh, can hear the rap yeah. crowd cheer, no pocket money to see mm-hmm. why here and stuff like that. And I used to live really close to Main Road, and I'd hear the every, and I'd get my garden like pooed and weed in like after every match. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. so like I, so it's really like, uh, but more than that, like the, the like the the tales of middleman and and stuff like that. You know, having you know um, dabbled with some fun stuff in my college days, I've you know kind of met some characters in my time and you know everything like that yeah. and it, it very much seems like it, you really get smell of a real kind of scent of Manchester from that record which I, I think is uh, why I think I'm always bigging it up to people is because I really love Manchester as a city I think it's a complex city but also somehow it keeps things fairly simple for, like it's people keep things fairly simple for themselves mm. in a good way like in a positive way i feel like uh compared to like say it's got just as much going on cosmo uh in terms of being cosmopolitan as london has but it doesn't have to be a dick about it you know what i mean so so i think like so i'm always like so i feel like dust junk is very uh just like uh, i'd point anyone towards the film um 24 hour party people like if they want to know you know just because it's like that culture i want them to know the city itself so yeah, yeah, but anyway, so you guys, so then this led to Johnny J giving you a shout, and and Steve, well, you, I will, I mean, you already I'm, hooked uh, up with Johnny J. No, yeah, it's slightly different from my point of view, and yeah. you know, many, many, many thousands of joints later, so you know, and God knows what else. <laughs> but I remember it like this: I remember um, Nikki and Johnny. I don't know where they came to see us, but Nikki and Johnny came to see me, or or, or Paul. Anyway, they came and they they, they asked me if I was interested in this project. And then he asked me if I knew anybody else. So that, that's where I saw it. Then I, I suggested you, because I've seen Sam playing on my step, and he's like, funky. I can't remember yeah. the whole, like, Peter Bell thing. I can't remember. Yeah, of course you can't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, do you remember but, having I, that night ever, and running those nights? That, that you do remember? No, no, I remember, yeah, I remember running them. I don't remember that. Just, I can yeah. vaguely remember. I can vaguely remember Sam coming down. Yeah, vaguely. But anyway, it doesn't matter. But I remember saying, yeah, Sam, he's great. And Nick, uh, and Mikey, the drummer, because yeah. I just thought, of all the people I played with on the scene, yeah. he was just like, you know, it, it, there was no other option. Right. So sure, that was basically yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So right. basically. Well, yeah. you've, you've, you've left out a bit there, Steve, though, really. Because, oh, probably. I mean, 
<laughs> this, this, this is this is partly I was thinking about it today, and this is partly one of the reasons why Dust Junkies ended up imploding. So, uh, if in some ways it was actually doomed from the start, but basically Dust Junkies started <laughs> out as as Nicky Johnny, two yeah. programmers, and Ganyu the DJ, right? Yeah. And uh, and they got Steve in actually. Um, it's because they had to do a showcase at um, was it uh, Anathea or what it was called. What's it called, that, that bar there now, down by Canal Street, can't remember now. But they had to do, a, uh, the story goes anyway, they had to do a showcase right. where they got Steve's band, Chief, as the backing band, because obviously they couldn't go out there with two programmers and a right, DJ. Right, yeah, sure, yeah. So, um, and after the gig, they liked I Steve. Know, but, <laughs> but, yeah, but they sacked <laughs> the drummer. Oh, sacked the, the others, really? Yeah, oh, God, yeah. yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. And you, you know, you, you be the turncoat and seeing the glory, you were like, oh yeah, I'm in. <laughs> I lost, I lost members of Chief. I don't remember that. Yeah, you're, you're gonna have to get confirmation <laughs> from remember, someone else. I don't remember leaving. I don't remember leaving one band for another. But it, it could I, don't, have happened. I, don't, I don't. I don't think it was uh, leaving as such. I think I remember at the time you told me that because um, I quite liked Chief as well. But I remember you telling me that you felt like it kind of sort of run its course anyway, Chief. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and I think Johnny was just asking you if you wanted to come in. Yeah, he was asking me, but he said to her, did I don't know any other members. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He said, I don't know any other members. Yeah, he thought she was a drummer, but he thought she was a guitarist as shit, that's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. If, <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching, <laughs> honestly, Grace said no, it's been no, out. <laughs> it's coming back to us now, Sam. It is coming back to us. Yeah, there was a little yeah. bit of like cheap and band. But then they asked if I knew any other players. Anyway, that's how I remember it. Yeah, yeah. But Steve, Steve is Steve is predominantly um, the reason, at least for, for for well, you are the reason for me and Mikey being in the band. Really. Right. Yeah. So and, uh, so and then it extends, it extends all the way to actually after me ignoring Johnny's phone calls for about a year. Really? Um, that long? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it yeah. wasn't that long. Well, it was it was at least six months anyway. Because I remember I'd, <laughs> I'd actually managed to turn because when he first phoned me, I was seventeen, and Whoa. when I first met him. I was, uh, I just turned 18, I remember. And I remember I only worked that, that it was that summer when I was working uh, in the toy shop and then got through to winter. And um, I was working in the toy shop one day, proper hungover, feeling really ill with my guitar. And then uh, you, you came down and went, oh yeah, by the way, um, Johnny tunes and some guys are coming uh, for a meeting with you. So once you finish your shift, come upstairs and uh, to meet him, and then I was like, "All right, now I'm trapped, and I can't get out." Of no, I can't get out of this. Can I? <laughs> I can finish was, early like, and go home quick, or something. But... One of the reasons I was so apprehensive about it, though, was because um, I was back in the day. I mean, I had Nikki's album. I was when I was 12 years old. I had, I had the North East Heights, and was yeah, like, sure, you know, I, yeah. I knew, the, I knew the lyrics to Almost Enemy like by heart, and was like proper proper empty tunes fan. So I was always a little bit apprehensive about meeting him. And um, what a fucking nightmare that was, eh? <laughs> <laughs> He's not here to defend himself, but yeah, where um, is he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, right, right. it's his tough luck, really. I tell, tell you what, it was. It wasn't actually. It wasn't actually uh, at the end of my shift. It was in the. It was right in the middle of the day. I remember you came down in the morning actually and told me that we were coming and I should come up for uh, for half an hour during my lunch break. So I went up. I remember I went up to the flat and Nikki, Johnny were there with Paul and Gary, the two programmers. And uh, we were sat in a circle. And Nicky, I mean, Nicky, he's constantly smoking and rolling. And, you know, Steve, right, yeah. he's right. really, like, tugging his <laughs> sleeve <laughs> too, uh, too much. You know. So anyway, they were, they were rolling and smoking. And it was being passed around. And I was thinking, I, I mean, I didn't really smoke. And right. It was passed to me. And I, but I didn't want to look like... Yeah. yeah. Don't so look like, uncool. Come on. I, so, <laughs> so I was smoking the, like, the rest of it. Like, and we had this meeting and it seemed all right. And, you know, the... When I was, you know, well, it would, about. wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, when they started talking about, um, I started talking about Tool and you know all the heavy stuff I was into, and Paul and Gary, yeah. they were proper metal. They were like, "Oh yeah, yeah, right, oh right. yeah, Tool, right. oh yeah." And little did I know that it was actually, you know, I remember you saying, Steve, it was the your, it, it was actually your words to be with it. It was, a, it was a cross between Primal Scream and Rolling Stones, and um, the fact that really. Yeah, yeah. Back then, I never listened to the Rolling Stones. Yeah. And, uh, Primal Scream, yeah, I was into the Primal Scream a little bit, but I mean, yeah. it was like. And, and um, if it was give out, terrible. give yeah, out, exactly. but don't give up is basically like the Rolling Stones anyway, isn't it? So it's like, right. it's very, <laughs> like 
there's no my me and my brothers call them primal stones because of that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, anyway, I do love them. I'm just joking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, I, I, I grew to love that stuff actually, to be honest. But like I said, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing when I first heard the band. But anyway, so we had this meeting, and uh, I've been up there, and I, came, I remember coming back down to surf behind the till and all the you know the discreet <laughs> mothers were coming in buying stuff. And I just remember I was sat at the till and I was supposed to leave the time to give me I just remember like thinking, hmm, uh, uh, what just happened about that meeting? I just remember sort of like coming to my senses and my nose was like, <laughs> it's far away from me. <laughs> and this, this woman from, the, from this new village, this well-to-do woman with a private school, five-year-old kid was just looking at me like this weird. <laughs> what is that with this kid? Oh, <laughs> this you could. But uh, yeah, from, well, I mean, then I was like, I was in then. I mean, that was that. I was roped into coming down to Moonraker and yeah, then we'll get into that experience, I guess, which was... Uh, well, yeah, actually... I mean, I, uh, if, we're, if we're up to that point, I wanted to kind of then, because obviously it's like uh, so... Obviously it's hard to say too much about that perspective. So Empty Tunes is an established artist who's now kind of at the end of his kind of career as a solo artist. So he's putting together a band with Johnny J being his manager and he already had the two guys programming. He, what, Johnny J got them involved or Nicky knew them or what is that? Is uh, I think they worked for Johnny. And, right. Um, and he, Nicky was just someone that Johnny had met and thought that he was just a, a superstar and needed to, sure. to, to be out there. So I sure. think that was how that all got together. But, right, uh, and then, I, so I, then... I remember anyway, Paul, and Johnny, uh, Paul and Gary worked for Johnny. So then, so then you guys are kind of brought in, and so you left to kind of sort out the music, or are you kind of like people come like like are you then is it then getting handed to programmers and then then refiguring it, or what what was going on in terms of making that? Because it's quite a fusion of a record. It it sounds more earthy than than hip hoppy to its benefit, definitely, and I think to make it last longer as well. I think it sounds better for that but if only people still listen to bands you know <laughs> but like <laughs> but like uh, but like I, I think um you know like it but it does sound there are little bits of programming in there and there are like a lot of dj and hip-hop influences in there so i was wondering about the makeup of like the dna of it if you know what i mean yeah well i mean i don't know if you want to go into that steve maybe you can go into like what we actually think of anytime you remember what? anything steve just jump in and we'll <laughs> shut up I mean, I, I remember all the early stuff I remember quite well. I can tell you how it, how it was, actually, because when I first went into that room in, in Moonraker and they played with the track, it was Hippie on the Highway. Do you remember that, Steve? Yeah. And that was the, that was the most finished track that they got, which was, um, it was basically, it was a sample of, um, uh, was it Clapton or was it The Who? I can never remember. I think it was Clapton. do it, do it, do it, do no, um, I'm, I'm actually thinking of the uh, the other one that we did, the um, uh, Long Way, Long Way Home. What's that one called? The Stevie oh, Winwood. That was, yeah, that, yeah, yeah that, was, right. that, was, that was much later though, that thing. Yeah, yeah, I know. Anyway, I know. Yeah. When, uh, but anyway, Hippie on the Highway was there, and basically it was it was samples from old records that Paul and Gary had that they'd stuck yeah. to hip hop break beats with uh, Nicky rapping over the top, and the whole thing right. was sort of like keyboard bass and stuff. And, much like um, nothing personal. No, it, it, I tell you what it sounded like. It sounded like it sounded more like uh, it sounded more like Black Grape actually. It was more that sort of. Oh, okay. Um, and it was it was Nicky rather. It was more rather than him like out and out rapping. It was more him sort of telling a story kind of thing, right. which um. I don't know, it, uh, uh, it piqued my interest, really. But then, after hearing that, um, they said, we've got this other track called Mushroom Stew, and we're, we can't really get to work. Um, the guy who owned Moonraker at the time, this guy called Colin Goddard, uh, and they'd got him to... He played a little bit of guitar, but not very well, apparently, but they got him to play little bits, and they sort of, like, chopped it together and had this little riff that they... they they weren't really happy with so they they asked me if I could come up with something they were like yeah well it's it's uh, it's country and it's this and it's that and I was like country okay never still, <laughs> never played country in my life I've no idea <laughs> I mean, as close as, the closest I got to country was Zach Wilde and that was right. basically <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I remember I was, I'll never forget it I was sat in the back room at Moonraker in the in the live room on a stool 
Johnny and Nikki on either side, like just over me like this. Yeah. <laughs> Johnny on the other. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Paul <laughs> just looping this great head pressure. It was <laughs> and, then, and then just going. Well, it was the most please. pressure that you could imagine. And, you know, if you imagine your mum thinking, "I hope it's going well for my son down at the rehearsal room." I can't imagine <laughs> a more nightmare scenario that she would see. I had two guys all like, "Come on!" And Nikki, I mean, it, there was a lot of humour in it. Do you know what I mean? But it was like the humour, dark Mancunian humour. The humour right. was the humour of, like, of like a torture chamber. Come on, <laughs> not like that. I mean, Nicky, with his, with, his, with his way, he's just, he managed to make it funny, even though it was like, you know, you, you could have rang social services at some point. <laughs> like, basically, those, but, but in that time, in that time, I kind of exchanged the place where Sam learned what they kind of wanted, what sort of, what was not right, right and what was right. Yeah. And then eventually it became this, like, just this conduit for riffs. Right. You know, so, so there was a sort of, I guess it's once sort of, you yeah, hit the stride. Once you hit the stride, yeah, it just yeah. all came falling out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and also what happened was when we started jamming together, we started to um, we started to gel as a band. So because Johnny had never really seen a band, and he got a bit excited about having a band. Oh, but right. It was also like it was also like Wild Horses because it was kind of like, no, whoa, where's the hip hop? You know, if you've got like a live rock band, it's not the yeah. same as like having just break beat. Yeah, you know, that's right? strict. So yeah, think, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this was the sort of um, a fault that was always there with the band, the sort of what this, what they, the, the sort of idea of what they wanted to be. And I can see from their point of view, it was like it was moving away from that breakbeat thing. Yeah. Um, and, but also, some this this melodic thing was happening. Nikki started singing more melodies. Sure. Johnny was a bit Johnny was a bit confused by this. She was like, "No, no, you can't sing." Don't, you know, Johnny was a bit like, what, right. "Am I right with this?" Yeah, yeah, I know you're bit, right. Yeah, he, the, the singing scared him. But to us, right. like, our dicks were getting hard. So right. we were like, but no, but it was. You could hear this. This vibe was thick. You know what I mean? We could tell. Sure. And Johnny could tell. He could tell as well that there was something going on here. But it was also a bit like, oh, what's this? Oh, Nick is becoming a bit of a singer. You know, so there was a bit of a conflict that never right. really got yeah, solved. Yeah. And I guess uh, moving open. moving out of like, I guess he's thinking also maybe as a manager, like thinking, well, this is empty tunes that I'm, I've got to yeah, follow yeah. up on that, if you know what I mean, rather yeah. than like, yeah, this, 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 we all got together and this synthesis happened and it became this like, oh God, listen to this. And you could hear it, it was like it was stadiumish, you know what I mean? You could hear it, it was like, this is, this yeah. is really good. And, but it was a bit like, well, it, could it be better if he was like, so I can see from Johnny's point of view, he was a bit like it was getting out of his control. And, and him and it was all a bit like this. And we were all a bit like, can't you see, this is great. And they were a bit like, right. oh, you're just, you're just a musician, you know, even though we <laughs> weren't. And it, sort of, you know, we weren't just kids that he hired. Do you know sure. what I mean? So it got it got a bit like you know, there's all this stuff going on. It was okay right, though. Yeah, it was yeah. never it was never terrible. I, let, it was never terrible. Let's put it this way. I came along to when I did come along as a uh, to to um what was it called? The Johnny Studio in in that was up by Sankey Soap. Yeah, that was the that was the Dust Runky Studio, wasn't it? In yeah, Sankey Soap. was oh, it yeah. just was that what it was called? Yeah, because I just yeah. I went up to there on the um, uh, like to claim some demos and stuff. And you were listening to, I want to say it's, um, oh, here I am. I want to say it was here I am that was playing. And you were listening to like a new mix of it or whatever, like kind of just analyzing it. And I was like, this is great. This is really cool. And Johnny's just like, ah, this is shit. I was like, what do you mean it's yeah. shit? <laughs> and, and he was like, he was like, you don't know what, the, what it could be. And I was like, I guess, <laughs> but like, but I'll just shut up, I guess. But like, <laughs> but you know, I, I I felt like it was even just as a kid, I kind of felt like there was quite an intense amount of pressure to kind of nail the perfect version of something, if you know what I mean. And uh, and he said that, um, oh, what was it? Something about a uh, guy who'd mixed Jamiroquai. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was Ali who produced that album. Yeah. Also. Right, yeah. Yeah, and um and I don't know, he kind of he was saying, "Oh, you know, it will be better or it can be better or whatever." And it's like and I was like, "Geez, well, if it can be better than this, then it's going to be storming, isn't it?" So, yeah. Well, it, it was probably worse than that. Yeah. I think we're all we're, <laughs> I, I think I don't know about Sam, but I guess I guess when we all have that it could have been like this, but I think it ended up the, the final product because of this fault it did end up kind of a watered down version of both of those things. 
Yeah, it ended up yeah. between two chairs, didn't it, really? It yeah, was neither one between... nor the other. Yeah, right, that's it, interesting it, to hear you say. I take it as, like, a really nice fusion of the two. So, um... Well, this is what I mean. Like, that, this is quite interesting, because maybe from an outside perspective, this is also what you learn. Obviously, the artists are usually like, oh... Yeah, the last better. person to get their own work. Yeah, yeah, sure. But the thing is, yeah, this... this because of this thing, it probably did actually make a fusion. It wasn't quite this, it wasn't quite that, and it made this fusion. Which was, like, which was 98, wasn't it? Like, or yeah. 90, 97, 98? What kind of year are we talking here? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so like that was what was going on. Everything was fusing. Radiohead stopped being a traditional band in the way that, you know, the Benz is mm. or whatever, and started becoming a trip-hop band, and, you know, everybody started. Like, if Suede's album had, like, loads of electronic stuff that year, I'm pretty yeah or the next year or whatever, do you know what I mean? And that's Suede, do you know? So, so yeah. Well, that, so. That, that was kind of the problem though as well, because I remember Johnny saying as well, because we'd, um, there'd been some, some something had gone wrong with the advance or something like that, and, uh, mm -hmm. and Paul, who was still the programmer at the time, was in the studio with us. He hadn't received his gear until we were, basically we'd cut, I think, all the, all the rhythm and the guitar tracks for the, for the, at least, if not all the songs, for the like, the lion's share of, of the songs in the album. And um, and after we were finished, we spent like two and a half months in the studio. After we were finished with all our bits, uh, Steve, me and Mikey went back to Manchester and we were just sat in the rehearsal room from 12 in the afternoon to 12 in the morning it was booked. And, uh, and we're just rehearsing those songs whilst uh, Nikki and Ganyu were in London where, where Ganyu was supposed to be doing these cuts and, and we had some extra vocals they had to do and they were supposed to be mixing it as well at the same time. Mm -hmm. I remember when we'd left it, we had this idea of what it was going to sound like because, I mean, it, the drums, the guitar and the bass were all there and it, it sounded, it was all like lots. Sure. It was like, it sounded uh, like, as far as I was concerned, it sounded great. And I remember when it came back from London and Paul had finally got his equipment. It's no disrespect to Paul, it's not his fault sure. at all. But, uh, you know, Johnny heard it and was like, this isn't what I ordered, kind of. Yeah. And, uh, and, for us, it felt like they tried to shoehorn all that sort of electronic programming in, stuff right. into something, <laughs> especially... They didn't organically have it. Yeah, I'll say there are two tracks on the album that I almost can't listen to anymore because of the way that um, that I feel that... it. I feel like it's two worlds colliding rather than okay. playing together. Which one's like, there, then? Uh, uh, for me, it's moving on and right. get the fun Okay. Um, whereas yeah, the, uh, something like living in the pocket of a rookie, and that was a different, that was a totally different story. That it completely works. Yeah. And that's because it was it was recorded in a, in a different way. I mean, this this living in the pocket of the rookie wasn't recorded at the same time as the rest of the album. That was recorded before. Um, right. Same studio, but a different producer, and uh, on all the programming on that is actually Mikey playing right. his kit. They sampled Mikey's. Right. Mikey's kit. Which makes a lot of sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, they sampled him playing out in the garden uh, um, with a, you know, just one microphone from like yeah. uh, 50 <laughs> feet or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it sounds great. Right. All, all, those, all those samples from that are, are, are wicked. Um, yeah. But there it was more organic because they were already a part of the track as we were recording. Whereas when it came to uh, like moving mm -hmm. on, especially. You felt I mean, like their stuff tacked on. Yeah, and I felt that it was, it was kind of like the. If you listen to, I've got some of the monitor, monitor mixes actually on the, on that of just the the rhythm section. There's no vocals, no uh, yeah, yeah. scratching. But um, if you listen to that and listen to the groove on it, it's it grooves. But if you listen to the album version, it doesn't groove it, as much. Right. It's been pulled by the by the programming, and it's, again, it's no fault of Paul's. It's just that it should just have been there. The and um, <laughs> what do you, you say, Steve? Steve? I'm just saying it plugs. And do you know? Yeah, do you know? Like, yeah. Plugs along, right? Now, can I just tell you a little story about moving on, right? Because on, moving on was years Great before. Track. Before you got involved in the studio. <laughs> right, right back before there was even the dust junkies. Right. I lived in one of my, one of my previous flats when I first started playing bass, and it was one of the first riffs that I played that I thought was epic. Right. Yeah. I, remember, I remember. You know, I know we're all as musicians, right? You know, you know, you like playing for someone, you feel really, really scared. When you're on your own and you're in your bedroom or something, and it was the first one, it was like, doo, 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 yeah, doo. Yeah, 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 sure, yeah. All right. Yeah. I could hear it, it was like that. It's That's a real that. thing. I've done a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't the riff. That wasn't the riff. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then 
he went on this journey. He ended up joining the Dust Junkies. Went, oh, I've got this idea. What do you think? And they loved it. And it all got incorporated. It was like, oh, this is great. And so it came out on the album. And it was like, oh, shit. Oh, you know I mean? That's I your first. So, yeah. So it's yeah, really. Personally. <laughs> I still like it. A bit of pill like to swallow. It. Sure, yeah. And let and me just, let me just say, right, right. Look, can I just say something about that riff, though? Because that riff no, in the beginning, that was how it went. That, that riff in the beginning was how it was. It was the... Uh... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, changed. but then... But then... It changed ever so slightly. <laughs> Johnny was absolutely livid when he heard it. I remember, I'll never forget the first time he came out to the studio in Milton Keynes there and heard the track and was like... What the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> and also because Nicky changed the melody as well, which also frightened him in, right. the, uh, in the chorus because uh, because you changed the bass line and Nicky was like, oh, well, I'm going to change the bass line. Uh, right, before <laughs> you know it, he's like, why is everybody changing everything? <laughs> yeah. I'm not well, paying uh, for this. <laughs> it, went from, it went from being Johnny's, one of Johnny's favourite tracks because he could hear the, you know, the stadium and all that. Right. One of, the, one of his, his, his hated tracks I think on the album and I think that's probably why he actually tried to shoehorn as much programming right, in bits there as possible. It, right. and, save it for know. himself yeah 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 basically yeah yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a shame, really. but I mean I mean you, you also had a, a problem with clearing like a lot of because you had loads of classic hip-hop samples that your DJ would play live that then yeah. you didn't manage to clear for the album as well so you had to kind of replace them with things that are a bit similar or whatever and stuff. Painful. It, wasn't that, it wasn't that we couldn't clear them, it's just that the publishing company decided that they weren't going to even bother. Uh, they didn't want to pay for it, even though... Oh, I mean, wow, really? They would, would gladly have taken... <clears throat> the hit, you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, basically. Uh, yeah. But they didn't want to do it. They, they basically just couldn't be bothered. With the but yeah, it's, it, it's quite... It's, it's almost like it, it makes the album, in a strange way, makes it like a spot what that sample would have been kind yeah. of competition yeah. sometimes. Yeah. And you're like, oh, that was meant to be sent so by, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've, actually, uh, I've actually got a version, actually, with um, when, we, when it was first mastered. I mean, these, we're talking really, really late in the game here because I've got a massive version of the CD just on a, on a, you know, on a gold disc or whatever. Yeah. With all the samples still With all the normal samples, really. Yeah. Oh, and Nicky that's... had to go back into the studio and uh, all, you know, he's, he's still got Gans cuts and they, he's cutting the actual, you know, the real records and stuff like yeah. that. But then every time he drops a cut, they chuck Nicky's voice in, they're recreating the... Uh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 the word <laughs> and then we yeah, yeah, voice. stereotype because I fit the description. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Know, so... it's lick. Yeah! <laughs> <That's> horrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. No, I, I think it works in its own way anyway. Like, I think, uh, I think, uh, yeah, it, 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 it maybe it would it sound, seems... in retrospect, maybe it would sound novelty as well if it did have the bits, like it would almost become this kind of like, oh, you know, they kind of throw in the what's they like. Sh at the time, it was absolutely perfectly spot on because I saw you live, like, at least a handful of times in Manchester and your DJ would be playing, you know, like, whatever sample it really was and everything and yeah. so and so it did work live but i wonder <laughs> if when you listened back to the record whether it would seem like slightly like strangely novelty in a strange way just because i kind of think of you as a rock band like if you were listening to a hip-hop record it's painful it's painful <laughs> whenever i hear any of those samples there's a little bit of pain you know what i mean there is it's a bit like oh um, I mean, we're little... making it. We're making it sound like an awful time, and uh, uh, and you must have had some. No, like... no, 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 no. It's just, I'm just being honest with you. The reality. Yeah, no, when, I hear the samples, when I hear the samples, yeah. When I hear the samples, it's like it's a little bit of pain. Just a little sure, bit. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm not. I'm not you know... To but be honest, did... though, I, I don't think. Uh, I don't think the the thing. The thing. I think what Steve's getting at, or rather, I mean, this is this is my view on it anyway. Is that um, we always thought of ourselves when when. I mean, even to this day, I think when we think of what the dust drunk is, we always think of how we were when we played together live and how we were in the rehearsal room or wherever it was. Um, mm -hmm. And it's funny that that's probably not the side that most people have heard of dust drunk is actually have seen or heard rather. They've sure. just they've yeah. heard the, the, the CD the and records, the, you know, right. the records. Yeah, and, and that to us isn't really what we're about. I mean, we were the band that you saw live. That yeah, was that a rock dust rocking. A rock yeah, and yeah. live experience, yeah, a real yeah, like basically. party, part in your face, party with a with a with a kind of with a slight edge of a 
gangster <laughs> cred or something. It felt like, like I yeah. totally felt cooler for listening to just like it sat in with my Ice Cube stuff and everything more than you know a lot of the bands that I listened to at the time. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So, mm. No matter how much Suede tried to <laughs> bring it, <a little. laughs> but, yeah, I love Suede by the way. So I'm no, no diss. Brett, come on the show if you want to. Honestly, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, but um. But yeah, so so tell me about some of the coolest, like the coolest highlights. Because obviously, I mean, there's the, I'm sure there's the more personal stuff. Like I've seen you play like the Northern Quarter stuff, which would just go off. It'd be insane gigs, like the best party you could imagine, but with the best live band you could imagine for that party. Mm. And like all, all tucked down one street and everybody going mental and everything and so so i have like those ones but obviously there's things mm. like you've you've played on some shows and you've been on some big stuff like do you want to tell me some of your funny memories or like your favorite memories or anything like that this is where my this is where oh, my yeah, memory okay comes. you take you take the reins sam and then if you well, if you remember no. something steve <laughs> no no okay let me, let me start go on have a go i have a couple I've got, uh, um, doing the, the um, what was it, TFI Friday was an absolute yeah. hoot. Yeah. That was brilliant. Uh, and Glastonbury was probably right, my, yeah. my, my best feeling I can remember with the Dust Junkies. And, and also a gig that we did on the radio in Amsterdam. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. That we did it, we went to Amsterdam to record for a. Um, Is that where uh, the, really... live, the live track's on the back of uh, Nothing Personal CD? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. there's two, two that say sto uh, stoned in Amsterdam and yeah. two that say I'd wired in Manchester or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Buzzing yeah, in Manchester. Yeah, that's right. Buzzing yeah. in Manchester. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Carry on, Steve. That's it. Boom. All right. So yeah. So 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 so, so Glastonbury. Um. So yeah. you did. I so love did... them. They're great. <laughs> yeah. I, I hate like Glastonbury. Them. Did you I hate, hate Glastonbury? It. Why? I hate it. Yeah. Uh, it was a year where it was muddy as fuck, and um, Nicky basically oh. he he got down there the year before, oh, sorry, the day before, and was absolutely hammered when we when we arrived. No one could find him, and then we found him asleep on the bonnet of a car. Um, and it was just he got on stage, and I felt like um, I felt like he was still pissed, and um, he'd lost his voice a little bit as well. And I just I found the whole experience just a little bit. It's hard. Uh, like I'm a I'm front man, and uh, I should never turn up to the the festival the day before we're playing because you'll party and you'll party late, and then your voice is messed up. Then you sleep outside in some, as you say, on top of a car or in a tent. Even is not much better. And then you get up and you've got to do this gig, and your your body's not ready for it. Your throat is totally not ready for it and yeah and yeah. probably your brain <laughs> and depending what you took the night the night before your brain's probably not really up for it either so what lyrics i have lyrics are you kidding me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair to be fair i think actually he actually pulled it off i think maybe i think he, uh, he was at least he, yeah he was he was entertaining anyway live I which remember. year was this i'm trying to trying to place what uh, year uh, was uh, your glastonbury must have been 98 i think i'm not sure though. No, i feel like yeah, i might have i feel like i might have been there or oh, maybe it was ninety seven. It was banging. Yeah, you know, it was great. <laughs> it what was. was it was. It was. We. Were, I think we were the first band on on that afternoon, and uh, and it was kind of like for me, it was kind of that sort of everyone's a bit hungover, everyone's coming down from the night before, and it was all a little bit sort of subdued. Whereas I was expecting yeah. it to be like. Actually, that wasn't the. I was in ninety six and ninety seven, and then I was at ninety nine. So yeah, I actually missed that. Was, so yeah, this yeah. is how I, how my, my my memory remembers that game. It started off, you're right, um, Sam, with all that. It started off being all like, oh, where's tunes and all this? And it started off ropey. You know, it started off being, oh, like the, that morning thing. But it didn't finish like that. That's my important thing. Right, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. Like, it got into its groove. Yeah, yeah, it got into its thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah to me, because uh, I, I, that's me was a big thing for me. And to walk away from there really yeah. happy with what we did was, was enough for me Wicked. to get the awesome. recommendations. It's funny. Yeah. Well, also, that, uh, oh, it makes up for it, moving on. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just no, setting I'm you up for that one. <laughs> no, 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 I'm glad it's recording. I'm just glad it's recording. You know, sure. It's right. Yeah, it could not be. Yeah, that's a that's a really valid point. How many songs out there that people have written that were perfectly good never got to be recorded at all? So yeah, I guess it's mm. good there's a version. Yeah. So um and Sam, what about a couple of your favourites? 
I suppose well, TFI, yeah. tell us about what you think of TFI as well, because obviously we've had heard Steve say that he liked TFI. So did you enjoy I, TFI? I, I, I liked TFI, but it was it was kind of a novelty, really. Um, but I mean, we were struggling a little, a little bit because Nicky lost his voice again there. Um, he went through a period where he was just his his voice was just knackered. He had this stuff from the doctor they had to keep drinking and stuff and uh, I think basically it was just because we were partying too much we were just up too much. Not lockets. Didn't do much. Not lockets. <laughs> <laughs> but I know I had to enjoy TFI. I'm here all night. <laughs> the, one, the one thing uh, for me personally anyway with TFI it was that I remember um, my guitar had never been so quiet and I'm not like a loud guitar player it's right. not like you know yeah. I'm going to drown everyone out I've never been like that and anyone yeah. Who's never been yeah right Tell you that. Whenever, never, whenever I've people are recording the... things, you always have to play really quiet, don't you? It sucks. But this was like, this was unbelievable. We'd played a few of these gigs before then. Um, like, uh, yeah, I can't remember any of them now, but I remember we played a couple of shows where we had to play live anyway. But yeah. I, mean, I remember having to turn my guitar down. Like, I could barely hear it when I was playing it. And I remember after we did the rehearsal, when we came back to do the actual live thing, I realised that someone had been up there and turned it down even further. Oh, no! No, I really couldn't hear my guitar while I was playing. <clears throat> but I mean, apart from that, though, it was um, it was a good laugh. I mean, did we? I can't remember if we actually met Chris Evans. Did we meet Chris Evans? No, I don't remember meeting him. I, was that why it was so good? <laughs> <laughs> that was that, I was a I was a big fan of TFI. I remember that then. I remember being up in the uh, in that little bar that he had. We know where right, he was. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. Where he'd shout out to everybody. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I just remember that. Being up there and thinking, okay, it's a lot smaller than it actually looks on TV. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, it was good. Laugh. Now, my, my favorite things were um, some of the highlights, anyway. Um, the first one was the loft gig at Sankey Soap that was actually, it was um, it was the Space Monkeys release party, I think. Yeah. Was that right? Well, we weren't even uh, playing. Sorry, go on, Steve. Go on. No, go on, go on. We weren't really supposed to be playing, um, but Johnny was involved with the Space Monkeys as well. He was their manager as well. <clears throat> and he'd got them on Pete Waterman's label and all that. Right. Uh, not Pete Waterman. Uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Tony. Uh, Tony Wilson's label, sorry. Oh, right. Yeah. Was that Factory um, 2 at the time? Was that Factory 2? I can't remember. Yeah, I'm not sure. You have to ask Rick. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. But um, they were, I mean, those guys were ace as well. We were good friends with them. But um, they were, they were they had a release party in Sankey's Loft, and uh, and Johnny was saying, "Oh yeah, you should get up there and do something." And it was like it wasn't really we wasn't really on. It was it was we weren't going to do it. And then I can't remember why or how. But then Mikey turned up and Ganya turned up, and then we ended up getting on there. And I was playing Rick's guitar, and and it was just like the whole place just sort of like went off. And right, yeah. Everyone just went, basically went went crazy. <laughs> we played like three or four songs or something, but it was like. Uh, yeah. If that was that was the first sort of taste of, of of how it could how it could maybe be, right. and then uh, another one was um, our first gig abroad, which is when we did in the city in Ireland. We were supposed to be there as one of the unsigned bands, and then in the meantime, we've been signed by Polydor. Right. So we were one of the uh, these three showcase acts, is kind of like this uh, hot ones to watch. Yeah. Yeah, it's more kind of like the uh, the success stories of the industry or something like that because they'd written so much about us as being an, un an unsigned band. Right. Uh, and we did a couple of gigs there and it wasn't necessarily the gigs that I thought that were great but it was more like the that was the first experience of being away and on tour and I was like like I said I was 18 and sure uh, I remember that was where I think that was where I got my nickname the uh, <laughs> can you gave me the nickname of the drunken master <laughs> <laughs> I think it was from there because I remember once uh, after the first gig I think we played maybe three gigs or something in that in, the, in that weekend three little showcase gigs uh the day after the first one i remember we had to stop the tour bus so i could go out and throw up <laughs> <laughs> and that was like a it was just one of those experiences where um after being like a kid and playing guitar in my bedroom and then you know going to college and all this and dropping out of college to sign a record deal that was kind of like the first time where it was actually sort of the rock star sort of yeah, yeah. life was sort of like, you know, I was given, given a little taste of it and that, that was uh, that was kind of fun, I think. Because you guys yeah. you guys were gigging uh, quite a while before Polydor signed you up, wasn't it? You were... <clears throat> yeah. yeah, I don't think we did that many though, really. I mean, we, no, had, we did like uh, 
didn't we do like how many did we do in that year? Wasn't that the year before? Was that before Polydor? No, no, no. Do you mean where we? No, that was that was the last year we were. These last six months we were together. Um, All right, thanks. Sam. We did. We did a. I remember counting. I think it was like 133 gigs or something in the last six months we were together. Wow. Which was, Really is that good. why you ended up breaking up? <laughs> well, <laughs> tired, like, just like I don't want to see these faces anymore. Okay. <laughs> to be honest, no, like, I mean to go back to what I was saying in the beginning. I mean the dust rookie started out as Nikki, Johnny, and two right. program, and in Johnny's head, that had never really changed. Right. It was still him, Nikki. And Paul, they were dust junkies, and we were kind of like interchangeable hired hands. Dust well. junkies band, yeah. And we would uh, the dust junkies I, I, house band. <laughs> I never remember. I, don't, I mean, rather, I'd, I'll, I'll never forget when. Uh, I mean, it's it's amazing. I've got those two guitars on the wall back there because when uh, when we signed the record deal and we got the advance and we were out buying instruments, I remember Johnny saying that, uh, "Oh, these aren't your instruments. These are the band's instruments. So if you left, you know, the next guitar player he would <laughs> come in and take the instruments." And that was kind of how he saw it. And. You know, <laughs> I mean, but I mean, it's, I can't really complain because that was how it was sold as well in the beginning. That was how it was sold. I was coming in right. as a guitar player sure. and I was playing these tracks yeah, that yeah. they'd written, and you know, I just had to do what they said basically. And I was just like, right. I'd help. But somewhere along the way, we had you this... ended up making all the music and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, and well, <laughs> we, we felt we felt like like a band of brothers as well. I mean, and especially I think it was the time in the studio really that sort of. Mm maybe cemented that because, I mean, Johnny wasn't there then. He was hardly at the studio with us. And we, it was like two and a half months in the middle of Midland Keynes in the middle of nowhere. Right. I mean, that was, that was, that was a bit of an experience. And we came straight out of that. I went straight on, on tour. And it's funny because Al Stone had never seen us live. Uh, the really? Of the album. He came, he came and saw us at the first, for the first time while he was, uh, I think he was, he'd already mixed like about, I don't know, seventy percent of the album or something like really? that. And he Crazy. came up to Ganyu after the show actually and apologised to him because he didn't realise that Ganyu was such a big part of the band, and Ganyu right. really was like a second frontman rather than you know. Yeah, DJ sure. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Scratchy ideas and stuff. Yeah, yeah. He was definitely. He was almost like a Flav. Flav. Yeah. Sort of yeah in yeah. his chuck or something. Yeah. If if yeah. Flav was useful enough to play decks. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fact, it, was, it was it was Ganyu that was kind of like the, he was the guy who talked to the crowd. Nicky was more sort of like the backseat sort of dude, even though you know he's Nicky's band he's the front man. It was Ganyu that sure. was, it was sort of yeah like, out there and being nice and yeah, yeah yeah spreading the spreading the goodwill vibes. Yeah yeah. Um, well yeah, he was the first one I met in person. Was really supportive, like straight away, like oh thanks for the demo tape. You should, you know, he got on our, it's back in the days of like maybe MySpace or something. I No, yeah, not even yeah. MySpace. Not even MySpace. It, before that, <laughs> it, we just literally had a website with a JPEG and a, and a bit of text or something. Do you know what I mean? And he went oh, yeah. and put a little note. That's right. I had a little cassette order. Like we made these cassettes, me and my mates, of indie bands and we distributed them by post. And he went mm. on the website for that and he said oh i checked out what you're doing and everything and you know i was like whoa you know so yeah that, cool? was, really, that was really nice so yeah so um so then so it just kind of came apart because there was no more life in it for johnny and well and no the, the brand I mean, name or just to just to backtrack a little bit it's because um basically right when we signed the record deal and that was all that and then it came to the publishing and we put this airing the dirty laundry here, but I mean... Oh yeah, like, if there's anything well, yeah. you don't want to talk about, then feel free. No, no, it's it's fine. I'm fine anymore. with it. I'm, I'm totally yeah. fine with it. But basically, right, um, the publishing company came back uh, and we, Nikki and me had just written Remember, uh, basically told me to write a song that was like Wonderwall. Right. So <laughs> I just nicked the chords basically to Wonderwall and rearranged it a little bit. And it <laughs> didn't <laughs> and, I didn't uh, notice. I never noticed that. It's going to throw I mean, me next I mean, time I listen to it, man. <laughs> you know, the, the daft thing is, though, I mean, the song wouldn't be the same if it wasn't for what Mikey and Steve had played on it. I mean, that sure. would've, it would have been completely, it would have just been an indie song, kind of. Um, <laughs> I can't imagine um, Gigsy doing the do 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 so the only ones to sign me and Nikki to the publishing deal. If uh, I think originally they just wanted to sign it, or rather, I think Nikki and Johnny's uh, their strategy was just to, to get Nikki signed. Right. 
right. then they came back and said, no, we want to sign Sam as well, because they'd heard that I'd written Remember. The, yeah, and the music and the chords yeah. and stuff, I guess it's yeah, a, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then it was kind of like, I, I felt, because I was, even, even then there was like two camps with, you know, I was in Steve and Mikey's camp, and then there was kind of Nikki and, and right. Ganyu, in right. a way. And I felt a little bit like, oh, wait a minute. What about the guys? Well, yeah. Are you signing this when no, not everyone signing it? And then the, Nikki and Johnny came up with this idea that they would, me and Nikki would sign, and then they would sign Dust Junkie Music, and then under that they would distribute to the everybody royalties, else. Right, how they right. not not necessarily to who had written the tracks, but how they saw fit, really. Basically. Oh, right. And that was a bit that's sick, harsh. So, so know. like moving on, for example, how how much would like. So not, well, not getting never, into never, details well, but like no, but so does that mean that you'd end up kind of not doing so well on like a song you wrote steve for example no in, the, in this particular case no but it, it would just mean that you know the writing of songs with a band as you as you probably know is a kind of a, a very odd process because you know totally, yeah. isn't it that drummers don't get anything for writing for example sure. you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah yeah basically they would be split into two there's there's the uh, there's the lyrics and then the like vocal melody whatever and then the rest of it is the music and that yeah. is like the chord structure all of the, the music yeah 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 <coughs> but yeah, yeah. You, you can't you can't like you can't copyright a, a drum beat or a drum in song. our first in our first show um i chatted with a guy who played bass for Sinead O'Connor during her first album and that and he was saying that they wrote all this stuff in the studio and then Sinead took out a pen and wrote down who wrote what on everything went off to the publishing meeting came back and said, I'm afraid they told me, you know, I wrote the chords on the guitar, so it's all my song or whatever. Do you know what I mean? And sorry, that's the way that it was or whatever. So, yeah, it's that you, even people I mean, watching this show will be like, shit, publishing can be a bitch sometimes. You know? yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, at the end of the day you, if, as a band, you can split it up, you can split it up about how you want, really. And if Sinead wanted to, she could easily have done that. But I mean, again, you take advice from different places but yeah, uh, yeah thing, sure. this, is, this is where the wedge came in though in the band though was that uh johnny and nikki they paid for a lawyer to look through the contract that we were supposed to sign um and i remember being in that meeting and the lawyer told us don't sign this this is right. a really shitty contract and you're going to get shafted basically right and uh and mikey being the the statesman in the band he was he took lead there and was like well actually yeah no you're right we, we let's not sign this go back and say we, we can't sign this we've been advised not to right and nikki and johnny basically hit the roof then and they were like well we only say it's, you know out of our good grace we say it's that meeting to get it checked out and you were just supposed to sign and that was that and uh and then they started like an argument about you know how can we basically give them uh, an extra lawyer's bill for something some that they were already paying when right. they were doing it out of courtesy to us, kind of, and, right. and that was but like where real. But you were coming from the idea that you're looking out for everybody anyway, because it's a bad, because it's a bad contract, right? Well, basically, yeah. But I mean, again, <laughs> they, were, they, they were they were free to deal, to split it up how they how they saw fit. Um, but anyway, long story short, mm. we ended up coming back with the revised contracts, and then people got whatever we made a deal that um, whoever started the song like. Uh, non-stop operation Steve gets the lion's share of that because it was his riff that started it right yeah. but then there'd be a portion of it that would be split that would be uh payable to just drunken music and then right. under that whoever was in the band at the time would also get a, a piece yeah, of it bits. yeah right awesome but it, I mean it's very convoluted but that was the right, start of it that was the start of the of the wedge then and it was like okay so really it is only Nikki and Johnny and right. the rest of us are kind of just tagging along for the ride basically sure um, so when did the ride become like I don't want to do this anymore? What kind of year was that? Uh, for me, it was when we went. Uh, we basically we'd used up all our expenses from the from the record contract and the publishing yeah. contract, and uh, we went to play the snowboarding UK snowboarding championships. It must have been ninety eight, I guess, um, in right. in Sass, Sass Fay in uh, in Switzerland, and we had absolutely no money. And uh, Ganyu was DJing. Down in the bar for us to be, I get drinks. <laughs> in oh, the really? Jeez. Yeah. Uh, and Mikey, we didn't see Mikey basically for three days. He was uh, at this point. He was in the back of the bus with his dark glasses on and his massive headphones and his hoodie pulled down, and uh, was listening to to dub reggae and didn't say a word to anyone. He'd turn up at the at the gigs and he'd, he'd, he'd play his bit, but as if he was like 
you know, we played the bare minimum. Right. So, you know, he's, usually when we play gigs, I love playing gigs with Mikey because he'd yeah, yeah. really go for it. Go and for it. Yeah, yeah. All the time and we'd all vibe off each other. And, yeah, yeah. And, plays, oh, yeah, and, you, could, and you could feel that he was just doing what he needed to yeah, do. Yeah, he was going through the motions. Yeah. And it was, to be honest, it was horrible. It was a, a tour that it was just awful. It was, for me, it was like, it was soul destroying, really. But then it came to a head there in South Bay when Mikey basically we didn't see him for for three days, and he turned up and played the gig. And uh, it was kind of after that, I think, that uh, he started playing with with Lamb. Oh right. Uh, who were also our, who were also our mates, actually. Um, yeah, I, uh, our, my manager's a huge fan of Lamb, like huge, yeah. huge fan. We we're only talking about. Yeah, Andy. Yeah, he was he was really a lovely guy. Uh, yeah, met, great, uh, great. Yeah. Andy Barlow. Yeah. Yes, right. And, uh, to, to, to bring that round in a little circle, he just did the first song on the new U2, on the most recent U2 album. Oh, really? Yeah, the intro track is ah, okay. is produced by him, which is... I, I was like, what? What, from Lamb? That's what I... Like, do you know what I mean? Like, on the U2 album? Like, yeah. So that was crazy, yeah. But anyway, yeah, sorry, moving on. Yeah, so anyway, that was that. Was that. So Mikey was on was playing with Lamb. He ended up playing on one of their albums, I think. Uh, right. And uh, I remember meeting Andy one time and he made a joke saying, oh yeah, sorry, we nicked your drummer. I remember thinking, wait a minute, you haven't nicked our drummer, he's still our drummer. No, he's just, just like, doing stuff with you, you or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, at the time we were making demos for the second album. Um, I was going around to Paul's, the programmer in, in Macclesfield. Right. And, you know, we were, it started off, it's funny because it was a little bit of a weird period because... Um, it started off with proper like bang into it and dead intense, and we'd be like making mm-hmm. musical. Then it ended up. I remember at the end of it, we were like sat there playing PGA golf on his Mac. For most right. Of the day. Yeah. Oh, we'd be asked yeah. to do music. Oh, Should we know. do some music then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I remember coming home one day and uh, reading teletext in a in my room, and uh, it said a uh, dust junkie drummer joins Texas. Oh, oh really? Ex dust junkie drummer joins right. Texas. I was reading that. It's like Mikey Wilson, uh, I guess. Dust junkies and recent drummer for Lamb has now joined Texas. And I was like, oh right, well I guess that means that Dust Oh, what well, a way to find out by teletext of all things. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> they don't even. Like, uh, there's not even a modern <laughs> equivalent for that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that was well, that was that was basically it. And then I mean, I just remember that the phone stopped ringing, and you know, I stopped bothering to call anyone as well. And Right. It wasn't like it was. So like, just no fizzled, ever, just all fizzled apart. Yeah. yeah. No one ever. I mean, to this day. From your, from your perspective, was, Steve, had, is that pretty much how it played out? Pretty much, yeah. Pretty accurate. And it sort of fizzled. It wasn't like a big row, bottles thrown. Yeah. It was like a sort of. Uh, a there, was really bad. there was some really nice tracks on that that we demoed for that second album. I still to this day, there's a couple on there that are absolute bangers. I think. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully, we'll hopefully we'll release them. Well, that's what I was, I was kind of slowly, but admittedly, we've, I've been talking to you for ages now. Sorry, I didn't mean to make it this long. Um, but yeah, um, I was actually going to, so, so what, did you do much in between before, uh, in between the times of you, um, be, before you kind of reconvened? Or did you just yeah, focus yeah. on your lives? Or? Uh, um, musically speaking. Um, yeah, yeah, musically, yeah. Uh, well, what happened after the Dust Junkies? Um, I ended, up, I ended up going into doing more theatre and stuff and working, doing hip hop theatre and oh, doing, um, doing, we're working with an artist called Benji Reed, who's a body popper, but had written cool. like theatre pieces, political pieces, great stuff. Awesome. We ended up doing, be, being a musical director for him for a while, just oh, travelled all okay. around and took hip hop back to New York and uh, it's had some good times. Awesome, wicked. Yeah, and that, various projects and I ended up um, moving to, me first I moved to Newcastle. Right. Um, Met a woman, fell in love, had babies, moved to Newcastle, um, started doing street performing, as well as carrying on jo- um, doing running jams, what I've always done. Sure. I'm just doing the same, writing music. Yeah, yeah. playing, playing, yeah, getting, yeah, yeah wicked. Yeah. And you, Sam? Um, well, I went on a bit of a downward spiral, really. I mean, because I was, when I joined, when I joined Dust Room, because I was thinking that, that was it, you know, that was, that was my band, and I couldn't, yeah. I remember I had a few offers after I'd left to join other bands. And you couldn't really picture really... yourself doing it. No, no, because I was kind of, I was kind of spoiled. I mean, there was a, a magic with with Steve and Mikey, and 
I mean, yeah. Ganyu and, and Nicky as well. But I mean, I, I just remember thinking, I'm never going to play with a bass player as good as Steve. I'm never going to play with the drummer as good as Mikey. So what's the, what's the point? Right. Yeah. It's hard yeah. when you get that chemistry going. Like with my rock band, I, I like I've been asked if I wanted to form other rock bands other time. I thought, well, no, I don't need another rock band because I've got my my guys that I like playing that with. Like if you came to me and said, do you want to do some electronic project or something? Be like, oh yeah, that's something I don't do like with these mm. guys really, really well. But once you've found that chemistry, it's really, really hard to kind of think, oh, like, oh, I'll go and sleep with this girl instead of my wife. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it sounds, actually, being honest, I made that sound more tempting than it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of variables there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so then you re so how did you all come back together then? How did that? Well, this is, this is the funny thing because, I mean, um, I actually, when I was, I mean, we're talking, I was 21 when we, when we split up, I think, when I was 22, mm. I, I ended up moving to, uh, to Denmark, which is where I've been ever since, really. Right. Um, and I remember we had, uh, when the Roadhouse was, it wasn't, it wasn't closing down, what was it now? No, it was there, was it their 30th birthday? I can't remember, I can't remember what the occasion was. It was in, right. I think it was in 2005 or something, anyway, um, like, this is, like, five, six, seven years after we'd split up or something. Yeah. Um, there was some occasion anyway where uh, we, the owner of the Roadhouse wanted us to play as right. we were her favourite band. Yeah. And it was some kind of, I don't know if it was her 10 year anniversary of owning it or 50 sure. or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't really matter. But anyway, so uh, she asked us if we were interested in getting back together uh, just to do that one off show, and we did. Uh, and my now wife uh, came over and filmed it all and stuff. Um, and I, I was thinking it might be, you know, the start of maybe a little sort of reunion or something. Reunion yeah, kind yeah. of, but it never really, it never really happened. And we, I mean, that that footage that she ended up uh, filming, that still had a load of digital tapes somewhere. Oh, <laughs> really? To, so just sitting yeah, there? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah oh, just wow. sat there somewhere. I've got like, I don't know, like 20 odd different tapes and different interviews and stuff. Oh, but wow, anyway, so. so then, uh, then in, was it 2015 or something, Steve? Uh, Nicky had been doing this thing with uh, he got back together with Paul, the programmer, and do, was doing this thing right. called The Ugly. Um, and while he was putting stuff out there, people were asking him about you know what's going on with the dust and he's going to do anything again, and why don't you get back together and do something? And, mm -hmm. and uh, he started knocking around with Vince Vega, um, Manchester DJ, yes, uh, and he was in with the, you know, doing some of the stuff with the guys who, who put uh, quite a few festivals and tours and stuff together. Mm -hmm. So he was saying, well, get these venues if you want to do something, then just right, do cool. uh, you know, this one-off gig. So, I mean, I, I jumped at the chance really, because I mean, I very rarely get to see Steve or, uh, and Mikey. And, yeah, yeah. And I just, I mean, just to play with them again, it was- Yeah, it was, yeah, of course. For yeah. me, it was, it was just, I mean, I wouldn't call it a dream come true, but it was like, you know, of course. I'm, I'm, like going home, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, basically, no, no, yeah. I, I love playing with the Dust Junkies. It's great. It's yeah. really good fun. It, it, yeah, I mean, it, it well, kind it, of feels it, like, it, I mean, from the, from the you know, the offstage perspective, it, I never at any point felt like I was watching a band where anybody wasn't having, like, the best time. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it always felt like you were having, like, maybe... At points, it almost felt like you might be having too much fun for what yeah. you should like, and how you well, still well, managing to play you, if you, if whilst you enjoying it. Two thousand and fifteen, then you would have seen Steve having too much fun on stage. There, <laughs> yeah. all, all, um, all the um, polit politics and stuff. It just it didn't matter when you're playing. It's, 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 yeah, we were, it yeah. wasn't. It wasn't like we were constantly battling. But it just happened at certain points of the journey. Yeah, but I, it didn't matter anyway. When we got on stage, we were just doing what, what we did for the most time. Yeah, 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 amazing. But, um, so, so then you yeah, that was 2015, and so you got back together and what put together a well, a it was, tour, it, was, it, was just, it? it was just supposed to be a one off, but then um, more people came in and asked us if what to do things, and then we uh -huh. ended up getting that, um, that headline date at uh, 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 what's the festival called now? I can't even remember, uh, uh Kendall. Yeah, Kendall, Kendall Calling. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah, Kendall Calling, that's right, yeah. Uh, and then on the back of that, you know, Nikki was saying, oh, have you got any riffs? Um, I'd just been like uploading little sort of little skits, basically just mm -hmm. like three bits put together with a, a drum beat and sure. really crappy 
line. And then, uh, but Nick ended up liking one of them, and he's like, oh, I've got this rap for this one. And that turned into us making the another, uh, day. Track, another day, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right, yeah. Um, and I mean, I would, I would have loved, uh, I still would love to get back in the studio with Steve and Mikey and, you know, have a couple of Thanks. weeks, jam her out and just bang out a few tracks. Mm -hmm. But this was something different, you know, because I mean, I'm living in, in Denmark, Steve's in Newcastle. Yeah, and, uh, so you're all by know, distance, back yeah. in Manchester, yeah. So it was, it was, it was, it was weird. It was different process with me on my computer in Denmark mm -hmm. and FaceTiming with Nikki and yeah, no, yeah. no, I had not there. <laughs> not there. <laughs> even, <laughs> even by the internet, you couldn't escape it. That's <laughs> oh, no. You moved to Denmark and you still had him standing <laughs> over you. <laughs> <laughs> How many years later as well? <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you knew that it was back to the old way of doing things. At least you must have felt like, yeah, this is the Dust Junkies experience. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it must be like, you know, the, uh, the, the workhorse that's, you know, that's been whipped all its life. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like, oh, it's, it's like coming home, you know what I mean? <laughs> Beat me again, <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, but it was it was good fun. So, uh, so we, we thought we'd try and keep the ball rolling, and we uh, we got um, we got another few tracks done. One of them was actually a, a re-recording of, uh, as Steve was saying, the you know the demos that we did for the second album that never got released. Mm. One of them was kind of a re-recording of that, as best as I can remember it, at least. Anyway, but um, so yeah, so then obviously you put out the redone and redusted, which I was listening to today, and it's in a totally different order to the uh, to the original done and dusted. Well. I mean, this is the uh, this is kind of uh, the st the story of of the experience of uh, how it's been really after, after we've got back together. I mean, we've <laughs> we weren't the, the most well organised of bands in the first place <laughs> to start but, off with, anyway. <laughs> but, but I mean, when the uh, when that uh, the reader the dusted went to the uh, went to the the mastering guy and came back. Basically, it was just put in alphabetical order, so it's <laughs> it wasn't even the uh, <laughs> it wasn't even the order it's supposed to be. In. Are you kidding? <laughs> no, <laughs> I didn't notice that. I'm going to go back and look, and I'm going to laugh my ass off in a minute. I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe <laughs> Nicky got it. Maybe Nicky got it rearranged after the fact. But I remember when he first put it out there. I was like, <laughs> I the order. He goes, oh, fucking hell! He said, fucking alphabetical order. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so then, and you had some, uh, you obviously tucked the um, extra tracks, like Beatbox, wa Beatbox Wash, obviously famously sampled by uh, Fat Boy Slim. Yeah, yeah. Um, does that, that, does that not give you some money now and then? Um, well, oh, is that, uh, that goes into, I guess, the tunes camp of, of stuff, because it was made, was that made? Well, he, he, uh, he, he it, it, it took him, literally, um, when was it sampled? That's from like, well, it must have been sampled in 98 or something. Yeah, something yeah. like that. You got the publishing finally in like 2012, I think it was. Oh, wow, really? And that's just because he was kept on pecking and pecking and pecking. And in yeah, the end, yeah. he had a, a lawyer just to say, look. 15 years! Something like that. <laughs> that's crazy. Nice nest egg, though, eh? Nice nest egg, man. What's that? Well, the problem is, though, he can only, he can, I think he can only actually get for the past five years or something. Really? Oh, right. That's crazy. I think so, yeah. So, yeah, so then, um, so then you, um, and obviously there's uh, great stuff on there, like Tickets to the Moon, which is like, that's yeah, always been a favourite of mine. Yeah, that's like, yeah. and I remember seeing you play that quite a lot live and not knowing why it wasn't on the album. And I'm pretty sure I have a cassette promo copy of the album, which had oh. some space on the back of it. And I taped ticket from the moon on the back of it so that I could have it like because I felt like it should be on there kind of thing <laughs> but yeah so um but yeah and that that's really um if people don't know the dust junkies already then that's where if you're a streamer then you should go and check out redone and re and re just redone and dusted isn't it it's not redusted <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, so yeah and so then so future wise like you you have what old songs are you do you ever think about pulling out these old songs that might have been on the second album and then combining that with a load of stuff and well to be honest um i don't think anyone's actually got a copy of any of those old tracks so i mean so i only be going from your memory basically yeah and i mean at and least it's not from steve's 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've not done too badly tonight. <laughs> well, with a little bit of, uh, of help, I would say, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, I think the... Um, the only, the, well, the one track I remember the best is the one that we've that we've done now that we've re-recorded. I mean, I would love Steve to re-record his bass as well because at the moment it's the version that's, that we've got in the uh, in, in, in the computer is just me playing bass. It's horrible, right? But, um, oh, guitarist playing it. bass, eh? You just just oh, oh more I don't pain. Know. more pain. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so. So then, so then, are you, have you have you got firm plans of any kind? Have you got loose plans of any kind? Is um, there just well, a will to do things? And I'm 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 willing and ready whenever whenever whenever. Basically, it's whenever Nicky is. I think really because right. um, he's working on Nikki, some solo stuff at the moment, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I yeah. think Nicky. Sorry, go on, Steve. Yeah, I think Nicky. Nicky, he, he kind of he wants to do stuff, but he's. You know, he's, he's got his um, he's got his son with him. He's got you know, there's it's it's kind of he wants it. He doesn't want it to be. He's got he doesn't want to put loads of effort out because we're all so far away. Sure. And um, basically, mm -hmm. unless it falls on his lap, you know, and it's dead easy to do, he's not going to be bothered doing it. So, and, and we're kind of all a bit like that because we've we've done the trekking and meeting each other thing. So, uh, personally, I think there is a loose plan to do stuff right. and to get these things finished. Yeah. It's not, yeah. but it's not on the top burner right now for all of us right, in our yeah. lives. If someone came along with a like a big watch of cash, you'd probably like be like, like, yeah, should we get this finished then? Hell yeah. Okay, yeah. so if anybody, if anybody's out there with a bit of spare cash and watching sure. a label that's watching this and wants like a decent record, like then, then here you go. There's one right waiting to be bought, waiting to be paid for. No, no. So, yeah. Half done. Half yeah. done already, crikey! Yeah, so there you go. Wouldn't even have to pay for the whole thing to be made. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, wicked. So yeah, okay, cool. And so, um, have you been like just lastly? Have you been? How have you been dealing with lockdown? You all right? Are you dealing with it okay? How about you, Steve? Are you, you're you're uh, home. Are you homeschooling, Steve? I am homeschooling, kind of. You know, being be honest. The intention was, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll do it properly, but actually it's become more like homeschooling on the rollerblades. We go out together or we go, you know, yeah. we'll, 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 do a bit of, we'll do a little bit of official stuff at the computer and then it's like, come on, let's go. So yeah. I'm loving it, actually. Actually, personally speaking, I know it's it's very different for everybody. Sure. I'm, enjoy, I'm enjoying the reset, the break. I can imagine. I can, yeah, I think it's, it's got a lot of, as, as much of it's got, as it's got drawbacks and obviously ignoring the whole, kind of people actually dying thing. I mean, just on a kind yeah. of like normal level, um, as much as it has drawbacks, it also has huge benefits as well, where you get to yeah. reconnect with people or just yourself in a strange way. So yeah. I think it's yeah, yeah, absolutely. that way. You're, I'm lucky I don't have kids. Otherwise I'd be like, oh, homeschooling. So if I just play them Alphabet Street, like does that count as like English? Yeah. Is that, that's all right, isn't it? That'll do. <laughs> yeah, it would do. It would do if you talked about it. Geography. I'll put on around the world in a day. That'll be. That'll be I just worked through the Prince education. Is that fine? Can I just do that? And yeah. Sam, are you handling? You've got. You've got. Um, a child. Is it? I've got two kids. Two you've kids. Got two kids. Two sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, they're back in school now. I mean, living in. Denmark, oh, are they? Denmark, are you yeah, already? Denmark. Are you already out of your kind of peak period and stuff then? Yeah. Yeah. On Monday, all the restaurants and the cafes and. and oh wow. So yeah. <clears throat> Well, wow. I mean, I've been just, I've been working through it. I've, uh, I've, uh, I'm mean, in the studio on my own, and sure. I mean, I'm not going. I'm not going to. It's a fairly hermetic it. existence, <laughs> anyway, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, my wife, I know she's had a bit of a tough time because she's been at home on Zoom, uh, yeah, and having to try and school the kids in the background, and it's you know two boys that are fighting all the time. So. <laughs> I yeah, I, I, I got two brothers, so yeah, I know that. I know that, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know that yeah. story already. Yeah, awesome. Well, I, I've like literally, I kept you for so much longer than I said I would, so I don't want to like you know bore you to tears one. or anything. But um, but thanks so much for taking the time. I I'm for one, I am totally keen to hear this Dust Junkies album. So please make it. Please do it. Like, at least if only if I'll buy a copy. I'll buy a physical copy. <laughs> Honestly, I, I I won't even just stream it. I will buy, like, I'll buy it on a vinyl. I might even, if the CD comes in with the vinyl, then I'll get both. 
<laughs> but, but yeah, so that's one sale. You've got one sale, absolutely. And I, I'm pretty sure I know two other people off the top of my head who definitely buy one. So there you go. You got that's an incentive. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, these, these, when you're starting these Kickstarter things, like you're literally like, yes, two people, amazing. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> so it's amazing how your how your um, kind of expectations can go <laughs> in the modern age of music, isn't it? So it? It'll never be like it was back then. Do you know what I mean? It's just no, it can't uh. get back around to it. So so we've got to just take the benefits of how it is now. I think so. Yeah. But yeah, thank you so much. Uh, you know, you guys are totally like I loved you when I was kids you turned out to be lovely guys in in person and uh yeah I think there's nothing better than that and uh damn fine musicians as well so I hope you I hope people are hearing you do it ever so soon so yeah but thanks very much yeah, and keep oh, safe keep safe and healthy and everything yeah stay safe